Hello and welcome to video 6 for week 2. At the end of the previous video, I talked about the need to measure the accuracy, the error, in an approximation process. We use Taylor polynomials to approximate complicated functions, so we can actually calculate values for them. But then how do we know how good our values are? This is a whole branch of mathematics in and of itself, in calculating approximations and figuring out error. We're going to give one theorem that describes how to control the error for Taylor series. So what exactly do I mean by error? So if we have a Taylor series on some radius of convergence, and we'll always have to work with the side our radius of convergence, we truncate our Taylor series like we did in the previous video get to get a Taylor polynomial, which is an approximation to our function. So in this case, I have a polynomial of degree k. Instead of going to infinity, I now go to k. So I get a polynomial. And I can think of the error as what's ever left over. So if I take my whole function in its, in its entirety and subtract the approximation, then what I have left with is the sum starting at k plus 1 and going to infinity. So I still am left with an infinite series. It just has everything that wasn't in the truncated piece. And we call this the error rk. So notice this is the error rk because it corresponds to the kth um, approximation, even though it starts here at k plus 1. So it's everything after degree k is the error rk. So we would like to know how large this can be. If we've got a bound on this error, then we can say with certain confidence that our approximation is good to a certain accuracy. So how do we do this bound? This is reasonably intense, so uh, I, I want to move through this fairly closely. So here, here's the definition of error from the previous slide. This is the thing we want to try to bound. Now, we have to work with certain situations here. I, I'm going to choose an interval from the video last time we saw when we did the approximations to sine and to the exponential function that higher degree approximations worked on a larger interval. So the interval we choose here is important. So I'm going to choose some range d perhaps less than the radius of convergence. I may not go all the way out. I may only want to approximate on a smaller interval. And then on that interval, the error ends up being controlled by the next derivative. So this is rk. That's getting rid of all of the things up to degree k. So this starts with k plus 1. The first derivative in here is the k plus first derivative. And I'm not going to give the proof of this theorem today, but in the proof of this theorem, that, that derivative really controls the error rk. So what I want to do is I want to find some number m such that this derivative is less than or equal to this number n on the whole interval. So not just at the center point alpha, but I want to bound for the derivative on the whole interval by some number capital M. So if I'm doing a third order approximation, I want to figure out, well, the fourth derivative, what's the largest the fourth derivative can be on the entire interval? And I'm going to call that number m. So once I've chosen an interval, and once I've chosen, uh, once I've figured out a bound for the next derivative, then the theorem is that the absolute value of the error is less than this bound divided by k plus 1 factorial times x minus alpha to the k plus 1 for any value x in this interval that I'm working with. So the error depends on which x you have. And you can bound this, if you wish, by taking um, the end of your interval. So this is at most m over k plus 1 factorial d to the k plus 1. Because this x minus a is how far we are out from the center point. And on the interval we're working with, the furthest we can be out from the center point is d. So this gives us a way of controlling the error. It's pretty involved. We've got to choose an interval. We've got to choose an order. We've got to figure out what this bound of the next derivative is. But once we do those things, we do in fact calculate a bound on the error. Uh, this error bound is what we're going to work with for the rest of the video, so I'm going to throw it up there on the left of the slide for reference. All right, let me do an example, because this is, this is a bit, as I said, sort of intense. It, 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 this is a tricky thing to understand and work with. 
So let me talk about the sine function. Let me talk about the interval negative 10 to 10. And in terms of approximations, that's a large interval. That's a large range of the function. So I, I might expect that I need uh, quite a high degree approximation to make this work. I would like for this approximation to be good to the precision 1 over 10,000. So that's good to four decimal points. The error is going to be less than 1 over 10,000. The error is going to show up in the fifth decimal point or further down. And my question here is what order do I need? With error analysis, you can always think of three things going on, an interval, a precision, and an order. And these all sort of balance against each other in the sense that if you want a larger interval and the same precision, you're probably going to need a larger order. If you want a larger interval and you've got a, a fixed order, then your precision is probably going to go down. You can, you can think of this sort of as a balancing act, that it's very, very hard to get all three of these things easily, that there are trade-offs. If we want to work with a low order, which means our calculations are easy, we're probably not going to have a very good precision, or it's probably not going to apply for a very large interval. We would like it to apply for a large interval. That means we could use our approximation for many numbers. We would like it to have a small precision. That means it's very precise. The error is very small. We would like to have a low order because that means calculation-wise, computationally, we don't have to do very much work. But to get all three of those things that we like is very, very rare. Usually, we balance them off against each other. Um, we say, well, we're going to have a slightly larger interval. Well, that will mean a slightly larger order, or slightly um, worse precision sort of this give and take between these three things. With the theorem, which again I've written for reference up here, if we know any of these two things, we can use the theorem to try and calculate the third. So if we know the interval and precision we want, the question here in this example is what order do we need? So I'm trying to figure out what k should be so that this error is less than 1 over 10,000 on the interval negative 10 to 10. I could have said, well, if I want a certain precision in a certain order, what interval does it apply on? If I want, if I have a certain order in a certain interval, what precision does it have? So given any two of these, I can calculate the third with my theorem. All right. In the theorem, I have this number capital M, which is a bound on the next derivative. One of the reasons that I decided to start with the example for sine is the derivatives of sine are sine, cos, negative sine, negative cos, so forth and so on in a repeating pattern. And all of these are bounded between negative 1 and 1. So I can take for sine and cosine m to be 1 because no derivative of sine and cosine anywhere in the real numbers will be larger than 1. Sine and cosine are all bounded between negative 1 and 1. So m is a bound on the absolute value of the derivative. I can take m to be 1. So it's a really nice situation for sine and cosine. For other functions, figuring out what m should be on a particular interval for a particular uh, order for a particular derivative can be a lot of work. So I'm sort of skipping a bit of that work for this example. All right, so I know my interval. I know my precision that I want. I want this error to be less than 1 over 10,000, 1 over 10 to the 4. Um, my center point alpha is 0 for the standard Taylor series for sine center is 0. I want a interval from negative 10 to 10, so the largest the absolute value of x can be is 10. So, and I want, as in the previous sl slide, I want m equals 1, or I, I can choose rather m equals 1 is a good choice for the sine function. It bounds all possible derivatives. So, I'm trying to figure out when this expression with m equals 1 and absolute value of x equals 10 when this expression is equal to or less than 1 over 10 to the 4. Now, this is not something I can solve directly because I've got n in a factorial and in an exponent. I don't have any techniques for solving to pull n out of both a factorial and an exponent at the same time. So I'm just going to do this by inspection. I'm just going to try things. Um, and I'll, I've done all the calculations by computer in advance. 1 over n plus 1 factorial, 10 to the n plus 1. And let's sort of see what they look like. If I start with uh, the fifth order approximation, the error bound is basically meaningless. The error bound is huge, so I have actually no control over the error. So n equals 5, the fifth order approximation from negative 10 to 10 is basically useless. It's, uh, it's nowhere near accurate enough 
to work with. So let's, let's keep going. If I have the 10th order approximation, well then this is still quite a large number. That's not very good. If I have the 20th order approximation, well this is a smaller number, but this is still a large number. The error is bounded by 20. That's pretty useless since the value is between negative one and one. So let me keep going. Once I finally get up to the 30th order, and again, I'm calculating this thing, just putting in n equals 30. So this is calculating one over 31 factorial times 10 to the 31. Here, finally, I'm getting a bound in the error. I'm getting that the error is less than 0 0.0012. That's still not less than one over 10,000. Um, the error here is is in the third decimal point. Um, that's not good enough for one over 10,000. I need the error past the fourth decimal point for one over 10,000, but I'm getting closer. Um, if I go to the 32nd approximation, well, now I have an error that's very, very close. This is 116 over uh, 10,000. So this is slightly larger than the error I wanted, one over 10,000. And finally, when I go to the next order, here I now have four decimal places. The error is in the fifth decimal place. This is an error that is less than 1 over 10 to the 4th, um, 0 0.0001. So my conclusion, again doing it by inspection, is that the 33, 33rd approximation, the 33rd Taylor polynomial, is good enough on the interval negative 10 to 10 for the precision 1 over 10 to the 4th. And that's a pretty high order. It's a degree 33 polynomial. It's a fairly complicated thing to calculate with. But I wanted a fairly large interval and a fairly small precision, 1 over 10 to the 4, good to 4 decimal places. So that's, that's quite accurate, so it's not surprising that I get a large number here. If I wanted a smaller interval, just to show you the difference, so negative 10 to 10 was a large interval, negative 1 tenth to 1 tenth, that's a very small interval. So here, if I did the calculation of the error on this interval, for the fifth order approximation, my error is already less than 10 to the negative 9, which is pretty tiny, or less than 10 to the negative 8. 1.39 times 10 to the negative 9 is less than 10 to the negative 8. And if I go to some higher orders, long before I get to n equals 33, I get some very, very, very tiny error bounds. So on small intervals, I can get some very, very accurate approximations with relatively low orders. So if I wanted to calculate with a fifth order approximation, that's just a degree 5 polynomial. It's not too difficult to work with and at least very, very close to zero, I get something that's very, very precise.